Good morning. My name is Yewande Akomalafe Kalu, but um, everyone calls me Wendy. Um, I lead the storytelling and branding team. And welcome to our, I think this is our 30, 33rd Grow My Business uh, webinar slash workshop. Um, what we do here is basically we speak to industry experts in various fields of business growth. Like today, we're speaking to David, who is talking about legal basics for entrepreneurs and businesses. But yes, we speak to various industry experts from all over the world, you know, from Kenya, Ghana, South Africa, Nigeria, the US, you name it. And we talk about marketing, um, revenue growth, um, sales, and now we're talking about legal. So we started this, you know, because a lot of businesses during the pandemic were were, were affected, you know, businesses had to close down and we they needed a resource to be able to, you know, get the information and the tools and tips they needed to be able to adapt to the pandemic, but also grow their businesses during the pandemic. And so far we've been doing this for over a year now and it's been very exciting. So welcome to today's session. Like I said, we're talking about legal basics for entrepreneurs and businesses. And our head of legal for Nigeria, David Olorote, is going to be taking us through the session. It's going to be very exciting. If you have questions about what you should be thinking about as a business owner in terms of regulations and what the law says, sometimes it's a bit muddy, it's a bit confusing, but today David is going to put all that to rest. He's going to clarify and focus your attention on what is actually important versus what is just white noise. Um, so I'm just gonna run through our agenda. Um, I'm doing the intro now, and then we're gonna go into David's session. Um, David's session is gonna run, and we may take one or two questions, um, depending on the time that we have. And then after that, we're going to go into the session with Jola. Jola is our product manager for Flutterwave Store. She's going to speak on Flutterwave Store a little bit, and then we'll come back to general Q&A. Um, and that's the full agenda. We'll do the Q&A and then we'll end the session. Um, just to also clarify, this webinar is being recorded. The reason that we record these webinars is so we can put it on YouTube for you after. And we usually will email the webinar recording to you by Thursday. So be on the lookout, check your email, check your inbox. We send this out by Thursdays to people. If you've missed any of our previous webinars, if you want to catch up, if you're just curious, you can check our YouTube. Um, just search Flutter Wave Grow My Business webinar, and you'll see the full playlist of all the sessions that we have done previously. Um, so, like I said, um, we're going to have a QA session, and it's very important that during the QA session, please leave your questions in the QA chat function. There's a QA function and there's a chat function. We want to use the Q&A function to answer your questions, but if a speaker asks you to do something or say something, you can type it in the chat box. It just helps us keep the session as interactive as possible to make sure that you, you know, you're listening to us and everything. Um, I think that is all, but if we're unable to get to your questions today, please send us an email, hi at flutterwavego.com. I'll come back and say this later in the session as well, but um, please send us an email, hi at flutterwavego.com we are unable to address very, very specific issues on this session. We'll be addressing what David is talking about and clarifying some questions that Jola will be talking about as well. But um, if, it, if your um, issue is too specific or if your question is too specific, we would advise that you send us an email or send us a DM on social media. I'm going to stop talking now and I'm going to pass us on to David. Hi, David. Hi, Wendy. Hi, everyone. It's nice meeting you. Good day, wherever you are. Um, and thank you for this opportunity to talk to you guys. Um, I'm going to try and make it as informal as possible. Um, so feel free to, I see people are already raising hands, um, drop a question and they'll get back. To, I will get back to you on whatever you might need. Um, I'm David and I had legal here at Flutterwave. Um, I've been at Flutterwave for two years now. Uh, it's been an exciting journey. Um, there's a lot that I've learned in that process, even though I thought I was experienced. Every day I, I, learn, I learn a different thing about businesses, about how uh, businesses work across Nigeria, Africa, and the rest of the world. 
And um, it's been fun throughout. Um, my previous experience has included working in the UK with um, um, Temple Solicitors. Uh, I've also worked with um, London Probation um, for a bit. Um, I work with um, London Immigration and, and, and Tribunals, uh, Asylums Tribunal. Um, and I've also worked in a couple of law firms in Nigeria, Strakam Partners, Olani uh, Wajai, um, um, to mention a few. Um, I have some consulting experience um, working at uh, Pricewaterhouse Coopers, PwC Nigeria, uh, all before I joined Flutterwave. So if I am talking business today, I would. Um, Pardon me to brag and say that I, I know what I'm talking about and, and definitely will be giving you uh, um, value on this call. Um, so thank you all for joining in uh, while I quickly share my screen with you guys and my presentation for the day. Yes, we can. All right, guys. Um, so basically, we're going to be talking about legal basics uh, for businesses and entrepreneurs. I want to uh, take the general notion that uh, most of the people on this call are either business people uh, in partially or full time. Full time will be the entrepreneurs, um, business people, someone like myself, I like to think of myself myself as a business person because I also dabble here and there in business. I have a couple of investments in, in, in some businesses as well. And so I like to think of myself as a business person aside being a lawyer. Um, and I would like to think that a lot of us on this call are business people. Um, and what I will be concentrating on without going in into too much detail because it's such a wide topic is some high level things that I, I believe that a lot of entrepreneurs and businesses generally do not pay attention to or have problems with and falter at. Uh, if you have any other areas that you think uh, you need expansion on, please feel free to ask those questions uh, when it's time for the questions. Um, the content generally will include uh, an introduction to myself, um, business stages, factors to consider at each stage, uh, and, and basic contracts and documentations that you will need as a business person. Um, as, as my slide says, lights, camera, action. Um, starting off, I'm sure everybody's familiar with what Flutterwave does. Wendy has given a brief introduction of what the company is, but just in case you're not aware, Flutterwave was founded in 2016. Uh, and our aim is to simplify payments across Africa. We're transforming payments in Africa and the rest of the world. We have a number of core values, which include being for customer focused, building trust capital with our customers, with ourselves, being loyal to one another, communicating respectfully, and ensuring that we create and innovate for our customers and everybody. Obviously, for now, we the companies headquartered in, in, in the US uh, and we have different subsidiaries, some of our partners and, and investors include, um, I'm sure Jolade will take everyone through some of our products later on. Uh, quick overview, we have um, Flutterwave for Business, um, Barter by Flutterwave, and we also have the Flutterwave store. At the in pre incorporation stage, the very first thing I all dear is to seek for professional advice. Uh, now, I know that that can be difficult for a startup, uh, an entrepreneur, but you will also find that within your business circle, there's always somebody who's willing to help and give advice. When they're giving you advice uh, professionally, you can hold them to it. Now, I know that this sounds basic. I know that this is not any magical advice, but you'll be surprised at how many people have taken wrong advice from people at the start of their businesses that have affected them throughout the business and actually collapsed. Um, and also I'm able to get any form of legal recourse from the people who have given them those wrong advice because maybe it was just a friend who was just giving you advice and you really did not pay for it. The question would then be, was it a question of professional advice or it was just a friendly advice? And, and nobody can sue anybody for friendly advice, right? Um, so again, it will be nice for you to find a professional 
who will be able to walk you through whatever the requirements are within your jurisdiction. When you have an idea, an idea is a very, very unique, not that unique to the rest of the world, because as you will have heard, there's nothing new. What type of idea have you had? Is it something somebody is already doing that you can model against? Is it something it's protection? Should be able to advise generally with respect to shares, non-disclosure agreement mentioned to you as a business person, it should be unique to everybody. And even if it was unique to everybody, you never can tell who is willing to take your idea and run away with it and go start something else. And I was giving the example of Thomas Edison and Tesla, uh, where it it's come to light now that uh, Thomas Edison had taken some inventions that belonged to Tesla and had gone ahead to patent it and register it as his own. Now, if you are going into an industry with a unique service, a unique uh, 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 product, it will be good to seek the advice of a professional with respect to ensuring that they draft you a proper NDA, number one. Number two, an NDA being a non-disclosure agreement. Number two, in helping you register for either a patent, copyright, trademark, indigenous design, whatever it may be. Um, now, there are varying rules around how those things work in different jurisdictions, but I can tell you that they are very important. There is nothing worse than going to market, finally, and having this great product and idea only to discover that there's a watered down version or a similar version by somebody else in the market that removes your uniqueness. Uh, that, that, that causes a lot of legal issues and problems and it may be hard to, to fix. So I would advise any new business person, any businesses that may have any unique selling products, trademarks, logos, things like that, to begin to look into that process. Generally in Nigeria, it takes a little bit of time, about a year, um, but there are countries, I know for instance, in Egypt, it, it, it doesn't take that long to register whatever product or trademark or copyright that you might have um, and all of that. The next thing will be determining in which jurisdiction, and when I say jurisdiction, uh, that just basically means area of interest uh, or locality in which you would like to establish your company. There are varying reasons why this is important. Taxation issues, ease of doing business, sourcing for raw materials, ability to go to manufacturing, uh, customer base, and things like that. There's a whole lot of reasons for you to properly understand the terrain and the rules that 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 surround you doing business in that country. Um, in Nigeria, for instance, um, you will find that there are different types of businesses that can be registered, generally under three different buckets. You have business names, you have companies, private companies limited by shares, uh, and you have um, also um, NGOs uh, and non-profit businesses. Um, there are ways in which non-profit businesses also make, make money uh, and also pay their proprietors, uh, which won't be illegal, but these are things that you need to sit down with a professional who will advise on and tell you which is best, which method is best for whatever business um, you are trying to start. The next thing that will then, and, and this is a cross between your pre-incorporation stage and your corporation stage, would be shareholders, business partners, co-founders, um, directors of the business, right? Uh, choosing a address for your business, now, I know it's basic, um, but you will be surprised that with new banking regulations, for instance, uh, there are people that are on the watch list with respect to maybe political association or exposure, um, financial crimes, um, just for the bank to know your customer, and then they'll come in and visit your, your location or your site. Uh, so it's important. So you, you often find people who want to incorporate the business and quickly use maybe their house address. That is fine. 
um, there's nothing wrong. There's, there's no rule that says you don't. In some countries, however, you will find that there are places called business districts and residential areas, right? And so it will be illegal for you to go and register a business uh, in a, that is meant to ordinarily be in a business district in a residential area. Now, I know that this sounds very basic, but you'll be surprised. I, 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 and, and this, I, I'm recalling a, a, a scenario in which I, I, I did have a client sometime um, in 2013 or so, who, who um, obviously had, had moved abroad and then decided to start a business over there and was registering the business and could not understand why they were refusing to give the person uh, a registration certificate only for them to discover later on that the address being used uh, was their, their, their personal address. Now, in, in, in the laws within that country, it was required that if you are going into manufacturing of any kind, then your business has to be situated within a business district. Uh, and that was the reason why it's incorporation. Now, this person had moved from Nigeria, where in Nigeria, there's really no checks on whether or not it's a business district or a house address. Um, and so the person I just thought, oh, I'll quickly do this and, and get away with it. So you need to be clear on those things, which is why you need a professional anyway. Um, but aside even just the address, aside the KYC, what is the nature of the business you want to do? And who are the partners that you are going into that business with? Are they going to be shareholders? Are they just going to be investors? Are they going to be uh, uh, directors? Um, which, which, which one of those categories are you going to bucket these people in? Now, what's the difference between a director, an investor, and a shareholder? Um, in some cases, you will find that all three can be merged. An investor is somebody who is putting down capital for your business, right? Um, and that person could also be a director, could be nominated as a director. I'm bringing capital, you're bringing the ideas, and we're merging ourselves together to form a business. In that scenario, I could be a director, you will be a director. Shareholder holds shares, right? And in that scenario too, I will be owning shares as somebody bringing capital in. Um, there are scenarios in which someone is bringing capital and not necessarily becoming part of the business. So the person does not want to become a shareholder, but he wants to give you capital to start the business and, and, and then get returns at the end of the day. He wants to bring capital in and become a director to oversee how the business is being run without necessarily holding capital. It all depends on the business model that you want to use and what the professionals are advising you. Um, but it's important in choosing any of those things to look at their antecedents, to look, do some sort of background check, due diligence of the person that you're doing business with. Um, if you are at any stage, maybe you're a student, maybe you are, you're just fresh out of school and maybe somebody has been your friend for a while, please do not go into this relationship without an agreement. You can have an MOU, uh, which is a memorandum of understanding, uh, which will clearly delineate what each party is bringing to the table. Uh, it's, I know it sounds funny. Uh, you want to do business with your mom, you want to do business with your parents, you want to do business with your, with your family members, and you think, oh, it's all hunky-dory, we have no issues, we're best of friends. When it comes to business, the law does not necessarily recognize your friendship. It may at some point, but it will be hard to prove and you would have gone through a lot in that process. It's always good to document things and it's always good to have those agreements in place. An investor is bringing in money into your business. What exactly are you giving that investor? Those terms need to be clear. When are returns supposed to be made? Uh, how are you sharing revenue? What are you spending money on? Uh, is anybody getting paid anything out of it? All of these things need to be clear in documentations that you are having, which is why it's always good to have a lawyer on board, going back to where we started having a professional. Um, now moving on into the corporation stage, the incorporation stage, sorry. Uh, at this stage, a professional will be drafting for you a memorandum of 
and, and articles of association for the company, which we usually call a MEMAT. Um, it will also be drafting a number of policies. Depending on the kind of structure that you have, there will be a draft shareholders agreement, um, which will clearly state how shares within the company can be moved around. If it's a private company, if it's a public company, there will be regulations that you need to look at in, in ensuring that all the documentation is as it should be. For instance, the uh, incorporation of a public company will require anywhere from at least 10 million shares in, in, in Nigeria. If you were doing a, a private company, one, 1 million shares. Uh, if you are in the banking sector, I believe it's about 100 million uh, shares. There's also rules about how much shares is capitalized. And when we say capitalized shares, it means not just registering the company and saying it has 100 million shares or 10 million shares. With capital involved, this is how much has been brought to the table in respect of these shares that we're actually talking about. Uh, who brought what? How was it brought? In what method was it brought? Do you have a foreign partner? In Nigeria, for instance, if you have a foreign partner, you will be required to have a CCI, Certificate of Capital Importation, right? And they'll be, they'll be required to go undergo certain registrations with the NIPC because foreign exchange is involved and there will be movement of capital back to the country from which that foreign partner is bringing in the money. So all of this going to play in advising you at that stage of incorporation, pre-incorporation as well, right? Um, I've mentioned investor funding, the type of company, what partnerships you have, regulatory compliance that you might have to look at. If you're a public company in Nigeria, will you fall under SEC regulations? Not all public companies in Nigeria fall under SEC regulations, by the way. It means are your shares available on the stock exchange? Um, and there are different types of those. So again, you need a professional with all of this. Um, are there any business permits and licenses that you require? Right, I, I mentioned jurisdiction, seeking advice of a lawyer. Um, but in Nigeria, it depends. Uh, and, and, and so you'll find across the world, um, if you are going into food manufacturing business now, for instance, you, in Nigeria, you will need NAFDAQ regulations, right? You need to, you need to sit, sit down with NAFDAQ and ensure that whatever you're, you're, you're putting out there to the public is okay for public cons consumption. If you are going into the transport business, it may not be a federal uh, 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 regulatory authority that is dealing with your issues. But I can tell you that in, for instance, Lagos State in Nigeria, you will be required to do certain registrations. Uh, I think even on a federal level, you might be involved or required to have some sort of registrations with the uh, Nigerian Post Postal Service, right? Um, and all of these things are things that only a professional as at the time of this incorporation can help you with and be able to advise you on. So now your company is fully registered. You have your MEMAT, uh, you have your shareholders agreement. You are now basically a business owner, entrepreneur, business person. What's next? Uh, and, and, and there are factors to consider at post incorporation stage. Now, this is where the meat of, of being a business owner actually begins to bite. Uh, um, in my experience, it's not just about registering a company, it's about making sure that the company can, can, can succeed, you can impact lives, and you can, you can actually begin to make profit. Um, I usually say that at post incorporation stage, one of the major things that you need to sit down with is your tax obligations. Are you getting any tax rebates? There are lawyers that may be able to advise you on this. A tax lawyer will be able to advise you on this. But there are also financial firms that are able to advise you on these issues. Are there any tax rebates that are available to you? I know in Nigeria, for instance, if you're going into agriculture, there are tax rebates that you get for the first five to seven years of that business lifespan because 
the, the, the government recognizes the need for agricultural goods and produce in the market and wants to help people go back to agriculture, right? So they, they give you those rebates that allow your business to grow. So you can plow in money back into the business. We know that the very first four to five years of any business cycle is always the toughest, right? Uh, and it's important that you get it right at that moment. So you can see somebody else's business and wonder how they are making it in a tough environment. And you'll be surprised that maybe they're on a tax rebate, which is helping them be able to plow back money into the business and expand and grow the business in those first few years, right? Are there any regulatory supervisions or filings that you require? Um, typically in Nigeria with the CAC, there are certain returns that you need to make. Uh, there's a period of time as well for you to make those things. Um, I think the first, within, after the first 18 months, a lot of these things begin to kick in with respect to board meetings, filings of annual returns and things like that. And even when you're not making profits, because I also hear this thing a lot. Oh, but the business was not making profits. Why am I, why am I filing anything? There are things to be filed to show that you're not making profits. It's also for your own benefit. You'll be surprised that as a result of you not making those, those, those the profit that you're required to be making, you will be getting also some, some tax rebates depending on the industry that you find yourself. So it's important that you get yourself familiar or get somebody who is familiar that works for you on regulatory supervisions and filings, which most companies you will find as compliance persons or even legal persons, what your tax obligations are. The very next thing that you then find yourself in at this stage is employment 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 is a very very tricky situation as simple as it sounds it's a very very tricky one um you want to ensure that you have tight employment agreements with your employees if you're in the tech space it's important very important as a startup that your confidentiality is covered so you have those ndas it's important as well that you have some sort of non-competes because you don't want to develop staff, train them, help them become the best that they can while with you. And they suddenly pack their bag and baggage and move over to a competitor. Now, there are different rules that surround how that also works because some people take advantage of that to turn, excuse me, uh, employment agreements into slavery contracts but only a good professional will be able to let you know what you need to do. Um, in Nigeria, employment is generally governed by the uh, Labor Act. Um, but again, there's court decisions that show that a lot of things that are recommended in the Labor Act have to do with maybe manual labor. So the question then is, if I'm employing an MD, an executive, what are the things that will be expected to be in that executive's contract or agreement? Can I employ an executive based off of verbal agreement? Is that, is that acceptable in Nigeria or in the jurisdiction in which you're working? Um, all of these things um, need to be discussed with a professional. There are key legal issues around these things that you need to be clear on. Um, remuneration of those employees um <clears throat> can you uh, uh go for days for weeks for months without paying an employee are you employing them per hour are you employing them as a consultant are you employing them as a part-time staff are you employing them as a full-time staff there's different types of contracts that deal with these kinds of things so you can't use a part-time or consultant agreement to employ a full-time staff and then expect full-time uh, 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 work from that person, right? What benefits do the uh, uh, employers, uh, employees entitled to under law? Things like leave, sick leave, paternity leave. What's the law saying? So you will find, for instance, in Lagos, there's a recognition for paternity leave, uh, no matter how little it is. It is. Um, not all states in the country have that, right? Um, and so if your business is established in 
in Lagos, Nigeria, it might not be a federal law that says you must give somebody paternity leave. But there's a state law. And once your employee is coming to you and asking for paternity leave, you're looking at the person and saying, this is not London. This is not uh, 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 America. Uh, and the person is telling you there's a law that says I can have paternity leave. So again, these are things that experts need to sit down with you and help you understand and, and, and navigate through. Leave is compulsory uh, under labor laws in Nigeria, at least 15 days of leave for any type of worker. But you will find in contracts that people will have longer periods of leave. Um, generally, the position of the law for any contract, for any employment contracts is once you enter into an employment contract, then the terms between the parties have to be fair um, because it, it may not necessarily uh, follow what uh, the law recommends, right? Uh, but there are basics that are required to be in there. Things like leave, uh, like I mentioned earlier, are required to be, be there, um, stating uh, remuneration and things like that. These are things that required to be there. Is everybody with me? Can everybody hear me? I hope everybody is, is understanding everything I'm saying. Yes, we're with you. Um, we're getting a lot of comments about it. So please carry on. All right. Thank you very much. Um, and then you come to things like insurance, opening up a bank, uh, corporate bank account. Uh, how do you go about these things? Uh, what do you need to do these things? Um, remember I mentioned taxation obligations. Um, within Nigeria, for instance, those things will come together, right? Um, if you want to open a corporate bank account, it, the, the bank will be asking you for a board resolution. Uh, if it's a business name, they'll be asking for some sort of introduction. Who are the signatories to those accounts? Who should be the signatories to those accounts? I've given you capital of 100 million US dollars to go and start up a business, You've opened up the business and you've made your mother the signature to my account, to the account, to be able to have access to the money. Or you've made your girlfriend the signature to the account. Is that acceptable? In what capacity is that person holding signature to those accounts? So those are things that have to be approved at board level, right? Um, another thing to consider in, and, and that brings me to another major thing to consider at this post incorporation stage which is the formation of your board. Um, generally, aside having people who you can trust, you want to have people on your board who understand the business terrain, who can give advice, and who can get you out of jams and situations as they come along. And people who generally see the um, vision of your business and can help guide you through that vision. Um, now, with choosing those people, there's also things like remuneration. Um, are they doing it for free? If you are, if you are doing, for instance, if you are incorporating in Nigeria a non-profit business organization, you have a board of trustees, right? Uh, and those people too are, are expected to be remunerated, right? clearly stating within your memos, I mentioned earlier your memorandum and articles of association will help with stating what the functions of those board members are. In some regulated sectors, within the board also, there's required to be board committees. And all of this in establishing them will require board charters which will delineate clearly the role of that board committee. So for instance, in the finance sector in Nigeria, there are certain board committees that are required if you are a bank, your, your board itself has a charter and each of those committees have a charter, they have a remit. There's something that they're meant to oversee in respect of operations of that bank in Nigeria. And it's important that the type of people that you are bringing onto your board are the people of the caliber that are able to help you grow the business. Uh, it's also important to have agreements with these people uh, and it's important to have a professional draft post for you. Um, moving on, you have insurance. 
some businesses require insurance. Uh, and it's always good to have insurance at any point. Uh, there's key man risk to consider. Uh, there are key man insurance uh, uh, packages that can be given by different insurance companies um, and all of that. Um, I believe I had mentioned intellectual property and trademarks. Now, again, why this comes up here is maybe at the stage at the beginning uh, of, of post um, pre incorporation, there was really no product, no, 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 nothing yet. It was just all an idea. At the stage at which the company has now been incorporated and the business is continuing, then there's a product, there's something that you're servicing and you're offering to the public, that thing, does it require intellectual property registration? Do you need a copyright over it? Do you need a trademark? What's the difference between a copyright, a trademark, uh, industrial design? What's the difference between all of this? All of these things are issues that a professional, a lawyer will be able to wade you through. A copyright generally deals with any writings, um, that people may have visual, uh, uh, um, property that anybody may have. So a movie, for instance, will, will require copywriting. A book will require copywriting. A trademark, for instance, every everybody is quite familiar with the with the Coca Cola trademark across the world, right? You want to make sure that yours is registered, and Mister A cannot randomly pick up your trademark and begin to use it uh, anywhere you go you see the butterfly sign uh you most likely um, um associate it with flutter wave right uh, and if i randomly see anybody other than flutter wave using that then i can flag that and say why are you using that to deceive the general public right um with respect to your customers at this post incorporation stage it's important to understand what exactly you're selling to them. Um, do you need a sales agreement? If you don't need a sales agreement, do you need terms and conditions on your website? Um, and these are very important. Important for various reasons. For instance, in Nigeria, there's the Customer Protection Act, uh, which requires certain levels of transparency from a business owner to the general public and their customers, right? Um, for instance, what's your refund policy? If there's any at all, uh, how can they reach you? Should there be a defect uh, or a complaint? Um, who are your contact persons? Should there be need for receiving feedback? Uh, all of these things are important. And these are places from which you can easily get sued or married in some legal conundrum that you are not able to get out of. Uh, you want to make it clear. Uh, what does your product do? What, what is contained within your product? Those are things that are called terms and conditions. Um, again, with contracts and documentation, I, I, I believe we have, we've covered a lot of contracts. But another thing that I wanted to mention to general entrepreneurs and businesses will be things like policies, right? Policies are very, very important. As you begin to expand your business, as you begin to go, you want people who join that business to know what they can do and what they cannot do. So like with the memorandum and articles of association at the general company level and board level, and then board charters that help the board understand what they are meant to be doing, at the level of the employee, you also need policies that help those employees know what they are doing. Is it okay for an employee, for instance, who maybe is within the logistics business to take your logistics bike on a merry-go-round and a jolly of his own? Is it okay? Uh, how do you do the refueling of the bikes? If there's a fault with those delivery bikes, where do you go to get those faults fixed? Can they spend their own money in fixing it? Um, are they meant to wear helmets? Um, are they meant to do regular blood testing uh, for alcohol consumption and things like that? Those are things that you need to seek with your lawyer as well and professionals to be able to draft and ensure that are available. 
in the manufacturing industry, you hear of things like SOPs. SOPs are standard operating procedures. They are similar to policies as well. Um, we are mixing uh, chemicals to be able to make a product. What level of chemicals have to be mixed? Can the person just go in there and do whatever they want? Uh, you are making bars of soap, for instance. Uh, is, is it okay that the bars of soap are not uniform? Uh, the packaging, of your, obviously, it, it's meant to look a certain type of way. There's information that is required to be on the labeling, which will be at a certain point, maybe in terms and conditions. Again, all of these things are things that a professional will be able to wade anybody through. Um, I always suggest that there's a standard contract uh, at different levels for different things. Um, one of them I earlier mentioned was the NDA, right? The second one will be a standard employment contract. Um, a third thing will be maybe a standard sales agreement or purchase agreement if you are in that line of business so that you can always identify your documents and so that it covers every single need of your customers and the people around you. Um, as you begin to grow bigger and maybe capture different markets, excuse me, you can then go ahead to standardize other agreements for different purposes, right? But those three, I think are important. Um, record keeping, of course, is also important. At what stage do you bring in a lawyer into your business? Um, for most people, they always wait, oh, we're big, until we're big enough and all of that. I don't think so. I think even at the nascent stage, it's important that you bring in a lawyer. Maybe not as a full-time employee of the business, maybe as an external consultant, uh, maybe on a retainer basis but have a relationship with a lawyer that is professional, not just your friend giving you random advice um, and they'll be able to wade you through some of these things, right? Um, exactly. I've discussed some of this. So you have the memorandum and articles of association, what your business plan is, any partnership agreement, joint venture agreement, tenancy agreement, uh, you're moving into a new place. I'd mentioned the address before. It's within a business jurisdiction. Maybe you are required to open and close within a certain time. Does that fit the nature of your business? If that is the case, uh, if you are into manufacturing and there's machinery, after a while that machinery needs to cool off, how do you ensure that that's in place? All your policies will tell you that. Employment contracts. Uh, employee handbook, very, very important. Uh, at the point, and I always suggest, um, for instance, um, in Lagos, in Nigeria at present, um, the payment of employee benefits um, and pension uh, um, payments is required for any business that has three to five people in its employment, uh, a minimum of three to five people, right? So at that point, it's okay to start also looking at an employee handbook. Don't wait till your business is 15 people before you have an employee handbook. Um, what we are sure of is human nature differs. So you might think that somebody understands and is upright and knows not to peel far um, change for instance, or normal pocket money for the running of the business on a day to day. But well, you'll be surprised that people don't. For instance, you work in a food business, you sell food to people. Is it okay for someone who works for you, who is hungry to take a plate of chicken and, and, and finish on his own without reporting it? Those are things that will be included in your employee handbook, right? Um, any contracts for payments of lawyers, promotions, um, financial advice or expenses and things like that. Those are documents that you need to take care of. Like I mentioned earlier, your director service contracts, non-compete agreements, terms of, I'm, I'm, 
of service and, and conditions of service. And this very last one, privacy policy, very, very, very important. In the world that we are in at present, everything is now digital. Everything is now online. Everything is now out there and easily accessible to people. What does the law in your jurisdiction say about privacy policy? Um, privacy of your employees on the one hand, privacy for yourself and your business on the other hand, information that your employees are giving to you, information that you are able, information that you are able to, to, to um, process and work on. Can, can somebody who has worked for you now have their um, blood type samples um, taken? Those things will be included within the employee agreement and under privacy. Um, generally for your business itself, information that you have taken from your customers, their address, uh, their, 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 their taste in food and things like that. Can you take that and go and use other than for the purpose that they've given you, uh, those are considerations that a professional will also help you uh, on the go. Um, again, I, I thought it important that we just do a quick rundown of some of the typical um, contract clauses that are important for any business owner to understand and be able to relate with. Um, this does not mean that you are now a professional to be able to uh, uh, um, negotiate that agreement, but at least you have an idea so that when your lawyers are speaking, you don't sound like a total novice. Um, anywhere where you require a power of attorney, it's important that a professional is involved. A power of attorney gives someone else the right and ability to do certain things on your behalf. And anybody who is familiar with property transactions will tell you how important a power of attorney is and what it can do. So if I'm presented as your lawyer to go on your behalf to, to gain certain property or to buy certain property and stuff like that, there's, I, I literally can do every single thing that you as the person who, who owns the property or who's providing the money for the property can do, right? So it's important that you get that right. Um, also for your business, in relation to your business, if for instance, a co-founder or an investor with you <clears throat> is providing your business a property that the business will be using, how is that taken care of? There are contracts and agreements that are, are written. Is the business going to eventually buy that off? Would there be conflict of interest if that person is still a director in your business and collecting rents from you? Those are scenarios that a professional will be sitting down and walking you through. Um, indemnities, intellectual property, we discussed that before. Um, dispute resolution mechanisms. Um, there are different types of mechanisms for resolving disputes and there's no one size fits all. Uh, but again, for someone like myself who works in the tech payment space, it's important that my customers have a level of trust in my system. Do I think that it's okay that every time there's a dispute with my customers, we end up in court? I don't think that helps uh, my business model or allows people to trust me enough. Generally, people don't want to go to court. So you need to be careful about the dispute resolution mechanism that you're using uh, when you have a dispute. Um, how do you secure data and protect data that you have received from your customers and partners? Um, what are the obligations within that agreement? Whatever the type of agreement is, um, depending on the type of business, does somebody get a right to audit the service being provided. So for instance, you have a service provider who provides you something on a regular basis that you use for your, for your business. Let's just look at maybe soap making, for instance. 
uh, and you need um, some sort of chemicals that help in creating those soaps or acids. Um, don't they meet a certain specification? Can you check the boxes that are being supplied to you to ensure that they are the specification that is required? Um, are there any warranties to products that are being bought? Or are you giving any warranties on the products that your customers are buying? What law governs the agreements that you are dealing with? So I am um, importing goods from Mauritius and I'm based in Ghana. What law should govern that agreement? Should there be an issue? It's impossible. Is it possible, sorry, to have both Ghanaian and Mauritanian law govern that agreement? Does it have to be Ghanaian? Does it have to be Mauritanian? All of those things are things that a professional will help you with, right? What are your rights and obligations under the agreement? Is there any competition clause under that agreement? Anything that allows for competition between the parties? So generally, you will find those kind of clauses that deal with circumvention, circumvention of a competition clause within a partner agreement, for instance. So you and I have partnered to do something and I don't want you poaching my staff. Is that right? Is that okay? Uh, do I need a clause that protects that? We usually call it a non-circumvention clause. Um, for closure of the business, what happens? What if the business fails? Do you personally carry those obligations yourself? So again, that goes back to the um, type of business that you have registered or incorporated. Um, if you are, for instance, a business name within Nigeria, the likelihood is certain obligations, including debt, will come to you as the owner of that business. If it was a private company limited by shares, the word or the phrase limited by shares ensures that all those obligations end with the shares of the company. So at foreclosure of the business, at the end of the business, nobody's coming to you personally to, to, to ask you for money. But that's not always the case as well. So it depends on certain factors as well. Uh, and a professional should be engaged to help you wade through that. Um, it's clear that you, you obviously have to have the names of the parties involved in these agreements very clear and, and concisely put in there. I'm always big on having an address uh, because in the kind of industry that I work in, KYC, know your customer is very important. So I want to know where the address is for those purposes and highlight it within my agreement. Um, is there any confidential clauses, information that will be exchanged? What's the duration of that agreement? What happens when someone breaches the agreement? So in a case where I, I am not satisfied with the service that has been provided, what can I do? Can I pull out of that agreement? Can I totally end that relationship? Can I get another vendor to provide me those services? Uh, can I go to court to seek damages? Those are things that are very important within the agreement. Can I even pull out of the agreement anytime I want to? A lot of people don't understand that, but a lawyer will understand it. There are agreements that tactically ensure that you cannot pull out of that agreement at any point you want to, unless maybe there's a breach or until the end of the duration of that agreement, right? So these are very important things that a lawyer will help you wade through and can cause legal problems for you. Uh, how do you amend those agreements? If I waive um, my rights, assuming that there was a breach, if I waive my rights to maybe compensation here, does that therefore mean that if there's another breach tomorrow, I cannot, I cannot raise that, that uh, uh, request for, for damages there? All of these things are things that, uh, again, a lawyer will help anybody wade through. Uh, and I believe that that generally brings me to the end of, of, of this presentation and we can go straight to questions. Uh, and I think we're, we're spot on time because I, I've done exactly about an hour here. So Wendy, over to you. I don't know if anybody has any questions.
Hi, David. Uh, thank you very much. So um, I think we're going to take questions after. So if you have any questions for David, you can put that in the Q&A section. Um, right now, we're going into Jola's um, session. She's going to be um, sharing what Flutterweave offers for business owners at the moment. So if you have any questions, don't forget to drop in the Q&A. And also, this is recorded, so you also get to go over this and go over the slides too. Hi, Jola. Thank you, David, for um, walking us through everything that you know, we need on the legal side of things. Um, this, my area now will just show you how you can you know, grow your business using a Flutterwave store, like Wendy had said before. Right, so first things first, you might be wondering what is the Flutterwave store? Quite simply, it's the easiest way for you to take your business online. Um, you get all the advantages of having a website with a fraction of the cost. Um, we are, you know, with many benefits at the moment, and of course there are more features coming up, but I'll just run you through the benefits that we have right now. So like I said before, you don't need a website, you don't need to be a tech guru. Um, you can set it up without the help of a developer. You're able to create and track invoices um, electronically, meaning that the, this is not something you have to do by hand and you know, have to start tracking. And then you're also able to create a seamless shopping experience for your customers. So they don't have to you know, find out how much a product is or if a product is available in store, they are immediately able to place their orders. You're also able to um, generate a payment link meaning that you give your customers the opportunity to choose what payment method they want to um, take advantage of, right? So there are tons of features. First one I'll go through is you are able to create products and their variants. So for instance, if you have a, a product that is a black leather bag and it comes in size small, medium, large, you're able to, you know, differentiate all of this on the store. You're also able to set quantities for your product. So if you have um, 10 items, you're able to put that. If you have less, you can update it as you go. And there is an inbuilt fraud management solution, meaning that you can rest assured that if your card, um, it, your card information is saved here, there's nothing for you to worry about. Same thing for your customers. And we are PCI DSS compliant, meaning that in this environment, your information, your card information is 100% secure. Like I said before, we offer multiple payment options, which include USSD, QR code, bank transfer, cards, you know, uh, the options are, are endless. And then we are able to accept local and international cards. We also have several platforms um, on which you can access your store. So there's the web and then there's the mobile app. So we are able to uh, fill this information as you go, see the orders as they come in, as you go using the mobile app. And then you're able to set discounts specific to your store. So if you want, if say it's Ista and you feel like giving a 30% discount, you can impute that on the store and that's what is going to be live for your customers. So there's so many reasons why you should use the Flutterwave store. And I'll just tell you how we even came about the Flutterwave store. So like Wendy had said earlier, it was better at the point at which the pandemic showed itself to us. So we started to think, okay, how can we help our, our merchants stay afloat, even though there's a lockdown, nobody's able to move around. You know, this was our own um, response to that. And so who can use the Flutterwave store? Just about anyone. You just have to sell you know, legitimate goods, which I'm sure you all do. And you are able to sign up in a matter of minutes. Like I said before, there are no boundaries. So you can be seated anywhere in the world and use the Flutterwave store. So I'm sure at this point, you're keen to see how the Flutterwave store works. And I'll just show you that quickly. 
What does the path to success in your online business look like? What are the ingredients needed to succeed in selling online? Here's the obvious things. You need the Fluxawave store. Here are the ingredients you need to succeed. Great product images, responsive layout, default payments integration, instant notifications, fast checkout, and even delivery. If you have no coding skills or knowledge, you're just as welcome because the Flutterwave store doesn't require any. You can create a store for your business for free and start selling in five minutes or less. Step one, visit www.flutterwave.com forward slash store and click on set up your store for free. Step two, complete the sign up form and click get started. Step three, check your email inbox for a verification mail and click on the link. Select how you want to accept payments. Step four, click on store in the side menu of your admin panel, fill in the details and take it online. Step five, add products and start selling. Create your own online store today and receive payments from around the world. The Flutterwave store. Just sign up, list and sell. It's that easy. What does the path to success? <laughs> okay, so that gives everyone an idea of what it is I've been explaining. Now, in terms of what the process is going to be for you and for your customers from start to finish, I'll just explain that in a few minutes. So um, I've used an example here, JK Fashion. Um, I don't know if it's a real business that exists, but anyway, this is just a, an example. So say a customer is familiar with JK Fashion and suddenly sees that on social media or you know through an email, they share the link and say, oh, hello everyone, JK Fashion is now live on Flutterwave store. So the customer clicks on that link, goes to the Flutterwave store of JK Fashion, makes a selection of what it is that they want to order, and then they proceed to check out imputes their personal information and delivery information, meaning that they put their full name and where they would like the product delivered to. And then the customer confirms all the information and makes sure that it's correct and then clicks on the pay now option. Afterwards, like I said before, a, an array of options come up. The, you know, it asks the customer what preferred option they want to go with, whether it's USSD or card payment. And then the customer makes the payment and you know that's that's it's you it happens immediately the merchant who is jk fashion then receives the payment you know in their wallet and is notified of all the information so if it's a gray gray jacket in size 10 all of that is specified the merchant can start to pick and pack the item and then the merchant calls on whichever uh, logistics partner they prefer. And then, you know, the, the merchant JK Fashion can always go back to the dashboard and then see what the, what the trends have been. So if they want to check, oh, how many orders have I gotten this week? Who has paid me? You know, all of that, they can see that on their dashboard. And so, I have, what I've done here is captured the details for Nigeria. Of course, you can always um, check our more comprehensive pricing list on just what the transactions are. So for the Flutterwave store, what we've done is we don't charge you for, you know, website hosting or, you know, domain name, all of that comes to you for free. The only charge that you bear is the uh, transaction fee, which is 1.4% for um, Nigeria. So it means that you will be, that is what will be deducted from what it is that you know, earnings are. And so in terms of when you get your money, you get your money the day after the order is made. So you see it in your wallet immediately. You know, you can see how much, but then you know that it's going to land in your bank account the day after. And so, of course, there are a few merchants that I would like to um, show you who have had a great time using the Flutterwave store. But, you know, just for the purpose of time, I'll show you a short one. Hi, my name is Jen Paoloko. I am an experienced makeup brow artist and the founder of Yangazuchi. I got into 
makeup artist in 2011 and it's been an amazing journey. Fast forward to 2014, I had an experience where I used an imperial eyeliner, which I couldn't have makeup on for a year, which really, really was depressing. And in my recovery period, I started to research and try to create my own beauty product that will be premium, cruelty free, superior, suitable and reliable for the African woman. And in that, I discovered that the African women or women were less represented in the sense that foundations, makeup, wearing that suitable for our complexion, the climate, they were not easily accessible to our market. And I decided to bridge the gap. At Yanga Beauty, we offer beauty products and services that empower the African woman to look good, feel confident and comfortable in the way that she presents herself to the world. At Yanga Beauty, we believe that the first requisite to success or to thrive is to confer a benefit and the reward will come automatically as a matter of cost. We are so big on customer satisfaction. We actually call our customers jewels because they are valuable, precious and unique in their own right. We're so big on social commerce and we build conversations and connections via our digital channels. So I love the photo wave store because it is super simple to use. I'm able to send that link to our customers and there's like an automatic invoice that just comes in. So even if I'm not around, my corporate support specialist receives that um, invoice to confirm the payment and then it's so easy for us to fulfill our orders. So I remember when I was trying to build up my makeup kit and I had to buy like a big eyeshadow palette which didn't quite turn out well and that encouraged me to um, make our own eyeshadow palette just putting the key colors there and liners. And I had a conversation with one of our jewels and she was sharing how she loves the eyeshadow palette because it was just exactly what she needed. That was so encouraging to read because it just meant that we were actually fulfilling a need in that time. One of the biggest challenges would have to be accepting international payments. I mean, we will get requests, do you have a retail partner in the US, do you have a retail partner in South Africa or Ghana? And it was so frustrating that we had this product, but we couldn't, you know, accept payments for them. And when we found Wave, it was just like a breakthrough moment for us. So we're able to accept, you know, we're able to accept different currencies on one platform, which is just mind blowing and just you experience, like we experience so many challenges. I, I don't think that receiving money should be one. So finding Pottery has just, you know, solved that problem a whole lot and just simplified our, our payments and operations here. You know. All right. So, you know, that's just one of the many happy users of the Pottery store. Right, in terms of the features that we have coming soon, there are quite a few, but I wanted to highlight these ones. So we're going to have integrated trackable last mile delivery, meaning that the merchants can see at every point in time where their item is, and then the customer as well can see, you know, if their order has been shipped, where it is at the moment, and, you know, it just reduces the back and forth in terms of communication. And then digital ad management. So you're going to be able to um, boost your sales by creating campaigns on any channel of your choice. So it's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. You're going to be able to run that from your Flutterwave dashboard. And so finally, ratings and reviews will be integrated, meaning that we will be able to really showcase our stellar merchants which i'm sure you'll be once you come on board i mean if you're doing a great job you want everybody to see that as well so we're going to make those uh, ratings visible and you don't walk alone throughout this process so we are very keen on growing the business which is why we're here today so we have these um webinars on a bi-monthly basis so um we will be sharing for free um lots of tools and resources that you can use to grow your business. In summary, 
there's no need to make life too difficult for yourself. So you don't want to, to wait on um, your staff or yourself to have to reply um, the inquiries before you can make money. You want your customers to be able to go there, see the link, see everything that you have available, see the price and just place their order. So sign up now. Thank you for listening. And if there are any questions, just do what Wendy said. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jala. That was very helpful. So we have quite a few questions, but we kind of ran over time. So we're going to try and answer about five questions. That will be our limit so that we don't keep you all um, for much longer than we need to. Um, for all questions that have asked if the session was recorded or is being recorded or will be sent out just to reiterate that um yes we are sending the recording for this session out via email and you should receive it by thursday at the latest um it will be sent via email to everyone who registered for this webinar okay so the first question that we're going to answer is um this is for david do we always need a lawyer to develop, for example, a privacy policy, TNC, or are there templates we can leverage? Hi, David. Hi, guys. Um, yeah, yes, uh, there are templates you can leverage. Unfortunately, the uniqueness of templates to your business may not exist. So my best advice as a professional will be to hire a professional so the next question, um, this says, powerful class so far. Let me drop my question on time. If my company is registered in US, but I live in Nigeria and I am a Nigerian, I pay US taxes and do business with US companies, B2B. What are the things I need to consider in terms of regulations and taxes? Um, so that's a very, very um, wide question. But generally, um, it depends on the industry that you work in um, in the U.S. and and how you how you regulate that. Um, generally, with taxes, I believe in the U.S. there are submissions that are required to be made, so you will need to get a tax professional in the U.S. who will be able to advise you on that. Uh, are there taxes that you will pay in Nigeria, despite your business being in? The U.S., yes, I believe there are, and a professional will also help you guide through that. Um, but generally, if you do not live in the jurisdiction or if you live outside the jurisdiction in which your business resides, it's best that you get a professional to help you guide through whatever um, you need to do within the jurisdiction of the business. I hope that answers the question. Yes, I think it does. So I, I have two more questions. These are a little bit specific, but I think that it can um, it can probably help um, other people. So first question is, thank you, David, for the elaborate explanation. To be sincere, everything seems a little bit overwhelming. I mean, it picks at the moment. I registered my company as a partnership, but I've come to realize that my business partner is only concerned about making money and has zero concerns about the processes involved in bringing the idea to life. I am considering asking the business partner to leave. Please, how do I go about this? Uh, I'm sorry to hear about that. Um, I would want to believe that there is some sort of agreement between, between you guys that kind of governs your partnership. If there is none, it may be a little tricky. Um, I generally do not like to go the litigation route because I think that it creates enmities. Um, but if that is what you need to do, then maybe you need to consult a lawyer. Um, generally, we partners, uh, as I would mentioned during the presentation, it's always good to have exit clauses in agreements which allow for the exiting of either a co-founder, a partner, and things like that, <clears throat> and delineate how that is done. If you have the money, you can offer to buy the person out if they are willing to sell. If not, then you guys need to get professionals on both sides and have discussions around it and see if there's an amicable resolution to it. If unfortunately there isn't, there are different other methods aside the court um arbitration mediation negotiation are all um 
mechanisms that that lawyers can employ to to try and reach an amicable solution to your problem sorry that you're going through that thank you david um so i am going to now go on to questions about um pottery and pottery store um so we have only two more questions that we can take just because of our time uh constraints but um First question, Jola, this would be for you. Um, we, uh, I believe this is what is, right? Um, but there's a typo here. It says, what is Flutterwave support for SAAS, so software as a service companies? I mean, subscription models. Okay, so is this, um, just to clarify, is this in terms of what they can use the Flutterwave store to do for those if that's not what you mean if you just mean in general so for invoicing for even payment rails if you want to be able to have an option where people make payments using flutter for checkout you can definitely do that and then if you want to be able to generate your invoices automatically you can do that as well on our dashboard but of course uh, we'll be happy to give you a more comprehensive view on what you can do, depending on what your requirements are. So please send an email to hi at flutterwithgo.com so that we can send you um, a more comprehensive response on that. Yes, and just to add to that as well, um, our, our payment links have a payment plan slash subscription um, feature that allows you to automatically charge your customers cards on a monthly or weekly basis as needed, right? Um, so that is something that you can utilize um, for payment links, but you can also obviously integrate the API. So um, if you need more specific information, I think it would be useful for you to send us an email, hi at flutterwavego.com, and we'll be happy to answer your question. Thank you, Jola. Um, last question that we have time for today. I'm really sorry. I, I see that we have a, a few questions, but um, last question is, my name is... Samson Dean, can Flutterwave integrate POS service? Can Flutterwave integrate POS services to a mobile wallet website? Jola, would you like to take that? Mm. Okay, so yes, we can. But then I would I would like to defer to there's a team that looks after this specifically. I would like to defer to them on that so that you know we we manage your expectations and tell you exactly what we can do from end to end. But yes, it is possible. Um, if you just want to please send an email, this email I will definitely see this email, right? So it's not like you will send it and then that will be the end of that. I can channel this to the team who looks after that specifically. Okay, thank you so much, Jola. Um, so we have officially come to the end of the session. Um, as I mentioned, we are unable to address all questions that have been asked, but if you have questions that have not been answered, please email us, hi at flutterwavego.com. That's our email address. And we'll be able to respond to you. I believe the response time, response time is uh, 24 hours, but we'll be able to respond to you within that time frame and address your issues, especially if your question is very specific. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. We really appreciate you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Jola. 